This is Wayne Goldsmith for the International Swim Coaches Association. Welcome to our series of short videos on a range of swimming coaching topics. We'll be talking about the physiology of swimming, about the biomechanics of swimming, we'll be talking about coaching and the art of coaching swimming. But today we'll be talking about the psychology of swimming and swimming coaching. You know, it's easy to be focused on the things you can see, you can observe, you can measure, you can count. You know, when you start off on your swimming coaching journey, the most common area of discussion and thought is usually about yardage and meters. How many meters per week should we be going? How many yards should we be covering in our practices? Or quite often coaches will be talking about drills. How many drills, what distance the drills should be, how much rest between each drill, what are the best drills to do for each stroke, and so on. And it's normal and it's natural to be focused on the things you can see and you can observe and you can count and you can measure. But as you evolve and as you become better at coaching, you start to realize that so much of coaching and so much of swimming is about the mind and the psychology. Let's talk about it in terms of the neck. So much of swimming is about neck down. It's about the body. It's about conditioning the heart and the lungs and the muscles and the nervous system. So much of what we talk about in swimming is what we call neck down. That's the body. They're the things that you can see. You can count strokes. You can count speed. You can count laps. That's what we quite often get focused on in coaching is the body things. But what about the neck up? The mind, the emotion, the thought, the way that the swimmer connects with and engages with their workout, their relationships, that's so critically important. So think about coaching in terms of neck up and neck down. It's about the body and the mind connecting so we have an holistic approach to the coaching of swimmers. Now, so much, as I said, is, is focused on the neck down, on getting this fitter and stronger with a higher level of endurance, increasing power. But how do you go about as a coach? How do you go about training the mind? I think it's as simple as this. For everything physical that you do, everything that's about the body, everything you do that's concerned with neck down, you also need to incorporate something for neck up. Everything you do for the body, there needs to be a mental and emotional and mind element to it. And I'll give you an example. I quite often talk to coaches about the fourth column. So typically when you write a training session, when you write a practice workout, you talk about volume, intensity, and frequency. How much, how hard, and how often. And most of set design and workout design and practice design is based around those three measurable, tangible qualities of volume, intensity, frequency. That's neck down. That's body stuff. I believe it's as simple as adding what I call the fourth column, the M column, the mind, the mental column. So that when you're prescribing something, a drill set, an endurance workout, a sprint set, that when you prescribe volume, intensity, and frequency, you then add a fourth column on how do I want the swimmer to think about this workout? How do I want them to engage with this mentally or emotionally? What do I want them doing during that physical activity? What do I want them doing mentally? Do I want them to focus on relaxation? Do I need them to concentrate? Do I need them to focus on a specific element? Do I need them to think about just their breathing. How do I want them to approach the physiology from a psychological perspective? Because coaches, where I think coaching can really boom and really improve is that we integrate physiology and psychology in everything we do. For everything physical you do, there's a mental component. For everything neck down, there's a neck up element. For everything you do for the body, you immediately integrate and incorporate something for the mind as well in everything you do. Now, I've got five laws of swimming psychology that I wanna share with you that I think will help you integrate and bring into being a more effective way of coaching the mind and the mental aspects of swimming. First of all, number one, mindfulness. Mindfulness 
is a technique, it's a principle, it's a philosophy that's been around for a long, long time. The Buddhists, for example, are absolute masters at this. Now, mindfulness is thinking about here and now, being present here and now, being right here in this stroke, this drill, this lap, this session, this practice. Mindfulness can be described very simply in terms of this. I am here, I am now, I'm giving everything I can to this moment, I am into and present into what I'm doing now. And it's a vital and underrated psychology tool. It's a very underrated swimming mental skills tool. Because when I can teach mindfulness, when I can have the swimmers present, when I can have the swimmers right here doing this workout to the best of their ability and even focusing on this practice, this lap, this stroke, when they're here and when they're present, we know that the outcome that we can expect from the workout will be much, much better if they're just cruising along and thinking about anything other than what they're supposed to be focusing on. Now, there's a lot of information online. There's a lot of podcasts and books and videos and articles about mindfulness. And I encourage you coaches to investigate the concept of mindfulness and talk with swimmers and educate them on the importance of the concept of mindfulness, about thinking about here and now and this workout, this lap, this practice and this stroke. Number two, relaxation is without doubt one of the most important mental and emotional skills anyone can learn, but it's critically important for swimmers. The faster you want to swim, coaches, the faster you want your swimmers to swim, the more relaxed they have to be. The faster you want to swim, the more relaxed you have to be. There's a direct relationship between relaxation and speed. And what we find is that when kids are young, coaches and their parents will tell them, come on, you've got to grit your teeth, you've got to try harder. Swimming fast has nothing to do with trying harder. It's got nothing to do with effort. Swimming faster is about relaxing more. It's about being totally and comfortable and relaxed as speed increases. It's so important because what we find, that integration of mind and body, that integration of thinking, that thought and approach, neck up and neck down, is if swimmers are in those last 10, 15, 20 meters of a race and they're thinking about effort and trying and striving and they start to tighten up. If they think about flowing and being smooth and relaxing, if they maintain that element of staying relaxed as the speed increases, they're capable of holding their form right through to the line. Now, a simple way of teaching these coaches is like this. When you talk to the swimmers about speed work, try to avoid, avoid words like effort and hard and try. Integrate the smoothness and ease of speed and relaxation into their practices. So you might say, okay guys, we're gonna do 50 meters at maximum speed, but nice and easy. So as I want you to go a PB pace, but stay relaxed and stay comfortable and flow and keep it smooth. So in all little practices, remember we talked about for everything physical you do, there's a mental and emotional component. So even in the introduction of a speed session or a speed practice, integrate the volume, intensity, frequency, what you want them to do physically with instructions and coaching around what you need them to feel and focus on mentally and emotional. The faster you want to go, the more relaxed you have to be. The third law of swimming psychology is visualization and imagery. If you can see it, you can be it. Coaches, your mind is such a wonderful, such a wonderful training tool. One of the exercises that I do in my clinics and camps is I ask swimmers to take some deep, slow, relaxed breaths. And when they're relaxed and when they're at ease, I ask them to imagine, to use their imagination and think about their dream. Where do they want to be? So for example, they might be wishing and dreaming and hoping that they could be in the Olympic Games in the future. So I ask them to see themselves in their dream, to have their eyes closed, their relaxed breathing and see themselves in their dream. And then I ask them, where are you? 
Who is there with you? Is it nighttime or daytime? What part of the world are you in? Is it warm? Is it cold? Is it dark? Is it light? What are you doing? What are you wearing? I ask them to see every possible detail of their dream. Because there's a funny thing we know that happens with high performers who are highly skilled in imagery and visualization. What happens is their mind starts to believe that if that imagery is clear and it's precise and detailed, the brain starts to believe that it's already happened or it's inevitable that it's going to happen. If you can see it, you can be it. And visualization and imagery, but not just saying to a swimmer, close your eyes and imagine yourself winning. No, that doesn't work. But close your eyes, stay relaxed and be comfortable. And then to have them immerse themselves completely in the visualization of an aspiration of what they hope to achieve and see every detail of it. So the mind starts to believe that's an inevitability that it's going to happen. Not, I wish it might happen or I hope it could happen but it's inevitability that it will happen because I've seen it. I've seen it in my mind. And a funny thing will happen is that they will start to work more systematically, methodically towards that future goal as if it's already there, as if it's real. The fourth law of swimming psychology is mental toughness. But mental toughness in a way that needs to be understood Apart from aggression, I think way too many people see mental toughness as something the footballers have, that they're big and strong and tough and aggressive, and they're out there almost in a warlike state. That's not what I mean by mental toughness. A mentally tough swimmer can do what they need to do to the training standard that they've set when and where they need to do it so that they can perform to the potential that they've set for themselves. They can prepare to be successful at a moment in time and be ready physically, but mentally and emotionally, no matter what happens to them, what happens around them, they can perform to that standard when and where it really matters. And when I talk about mental toughness, I describe it in these terms, that mental toughness is when an athlete can do what they need to do, when they can perform to the standard which is expected, no matter what's happening to them or what's happening around them. So it might be light or dark or difficult or challenging. They could be tired. They could be stressed out. They could have people trying to psych them out, but they still perform to the standard that they've trained to no matter where they are and they can do it when and where it really matters. Now, coaches, you can coach mental toughness, not by telling them to go and play football and do weights and get big and strong. You coach mental toughness by working through a process with your drills and your skills and your technique work, where you teach swimmers to progressively maintain technique and skill and control and form through increasing speed when they get tired and fatigued with increasing mental pressure and emotional pressure, and you teach them to do those things in training, and then you test them and train them to do the same things in competition. It's a progressive development approach to mental toughness, where you evolve their ability to do their skills, their technique, to swim at their speeds, when and where it matters, by progressing them through a process of being able to do what they need to do at high speed, in fatigue conditions, under emotional pressure, consistently well. Mental toughness is about doing what you need to do when and where you need to do it. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, number five rule, the number five law of swimming psychology. It's all about discretionary effort. It's all about the swimmer choosing to be extraordinary. Of all the mind skills, of all the mental techniques that your swimmers can learn, it's understanding that success is a choice. In fact, success is their choice. Once a swimmer understands that if it is to be, it is up to me. Once a swimmer takes responsibility and ownership for the standard of their own training, and once a swimmer starts applying the principle of discretionary effort 
they become unstoppable. Discretionary effort is when an athlete is so engaged with their program that they give you more than could reasonably be expected. So you might ask a swimmer to train four times a week. They turn up for the fifth workout. You might ask a swimmer to stay at home sometimes and maybe do some dry land work. They not only do it, but they record it and they show you later and ask you for feedback. Or they might say, hey coach, can I stay back tonight and work on some starts? Or they might say to another member of their team, hey guys, why don't we stay back and do some turns practice or some relay changeovers? Coaches, once a swimmer understands that the success that they seek and the success that you would like to see them attain is so much about their choices and their commitment to discretionary effort, doing more than could reasonably be expected. Once they understand that, everything changes for them. You know, quite often people ask me about motivating athletes or trying to help them concentrate and focus. Those things have got a role at different stages, but to me it all comes together. When a swimmer chooses deliberately and purposefully to be remarkable, through the expression of discretionary effort. When you ask them for five, they do six. When you ask them for A, they give you A plus B and maybe even C. When they choose that they themselves will drive the success of their own program, everything changes. So let's recap. Everything physical that you do has a mental and emotional component. So next time you look at your workout, next time you look at what you're prescribing, and you see laps, and you see stroke, and you see time cycles. When you're looking at 20 times 50 fly on 130, stop. Stop for a moment and think, I've got the physiology right. That makes sense. What I'm doing there, I've got it. Volume, intensity, frequency. But what's the mental and emotional side? How do I want them to feel? How do I want them to mentally engage with this part of the workout? So be always looking to add a mental and emotional element to everything physical that you do. Think about that funny story about neck up and neck down. Every time you do anything for neck down, do something for neck up. If you do something for strength, do something on relaxation. If you do something for speed, do something on relaxation. If you do something on endurance, do something on flow and rhythm. Everything you do neck down, do something neck up. And then those five laws of swimming psychology again. Firstly, mindfulness. Study, learn, and get into mindfulness. Have a deep understanding of this session, this workout, teaching swimmers to be present here and now, and that everything they do is the best that they're capable of doing right here and right now. Secondly, relaxation. The faster you want to go, the more relaxed you have to be. And every time you talk about speed and explosiveness, make sure there's a description of flow, of rhythm, of relaxation, of ease, of smooth. The faster you want to go, the more relaxed you have to be. Number three, visualization and imagery. If you see it, you can be it. Help swimmers to relax, to lay down or sit down wherever the opportunity presents, to close their eyes, and not just think about their dream, but see themselves in the moment of their dream, their future aspiration. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it smell like? Where are they? Because if they can see it, if they can see it here, they can do it here. Fourth, mental toughness. It's got nothing to do with aggression. It's got nothing to do with sticking your chest out and being brave. Mental toughness is the ability to do what you've trained to do when and where you need to do it in competition. And it's a process of evolving drills and skills and training through speed, fatigue, and pressure situations in training so you know with certainty that the swimmer can do what they have to do when and where they need to do it. And finally, discretionary effort is critical. Once a swimmer assumes ownership for the standard of their own training, for doing little things like packing their own bag, getting to work out on time, setting their own alarm, contributing to team activities, helping the coach set up. And once they start accepting responsibility and understand the concept that if it is to be, it is up to me, everything changes. 
once they feel that this is my program, my workout, my practice, my PB, once they understand that success is a choice, that success is their choice, everything changes. This has been Wayne Goldsmith for the International Swim Coaches Association.